Hello, I'm Paul Michael Glazer, and you are watching Mr. Media. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to author Cambry Cruz. Her new book is called Burn Down the Ground, a memoir. Stick around. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of angry construction workers who are dumb with a capital D and dumber, but can hear every word I'm saying in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. <laughs> This is not a show people tune into for a lot of heartbreaking conversation. I'm not Oprah, and I don't enjoy fiddling with your heartstrings. So, on its own merits, I honestly would never have chosen Camry Cruz's new book, Burn Down the Ground, a memoir, as a topic of conversation. But there's a quirky bit of Mr. Media history tangled up here. Several years ago, Camry's husband, comedian Christian Finnegan, was a guest on the show. We got to talking about different types of humor and in-law jokes, and he made a remark about how he doesn't joke about his because his mother-in-law is a lovely woman and his deaf father-in-law is serving 20 years in a Texan, Texas prison for attempted murder. Bada-bing? No, I don't <laughs> think so. And that momentarily brought the conversation to a halt. And frankly, I didn't know what to say. Okay, flash forward. A few weeks ago, a publicist pitched me on a new book by Cambry Cruz about her insanely crazy, sometimes violent upbringing as a hearing child of deaf parents. I didn't really think it was right for this show until I read the last line of the pitch. She is married to stand-up comedian Christian Finnegan. Okay, Cambry, quick, what's the American sign What's American Sign Language for holy shit? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, this is shit. Okay. <laughs> so, <let's just laughs> um, holy shit. I don't know if that, that's how a deaf person would be, uh, would react. They would be like... <laughs> <laughs> but you, got the, you, you, you got the picture. Yeah. Um, so, so suddenly I had the opportunity to get what the late broadcaster Paul Harvey would call the rest of the story. <laughs> so... Cambry Cruz, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you very much for having me. I love this. Yeah. You know, deaf people have been using video conferencing for years and texting in the 80s when hearing people think that this is just so groundbreaking. Eh, it's old stuff, old school stuff. It's, uh, I'm, I'm sure that for, for you know, people who are deaf that this is, a, is an amazing opportunity. It, it, <sighs> such a dramatic, I mean, I, I know from the book, you, you, you have plenty of experience with the TTY systems. And, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, this, is, this just change, it must change the world dramatically. Oh, so dramatically. I wish, I wish, wish, wish this had been around when my uh, parents were kids because I think part of why my dad is sitting in prison right now is because he's so many anger issues and abandonment issues that are all wrapped up in his deafness. My mom is a very... Uh, a happily deaf person. Like a lot of deaf people are very proud to be deaf and if they had a deaf child they, it would be a, a miracle. They would really embrace that. Whereas my dad uh, was not born culturally deaf and he just has so much anger built up in it. He wishes he was hearing. So. Now, there's other things I want to ask you but you mentioned your mom and I want to clarify. Your mom, at, at least during much of the story, wore hearing aids. Yeah, she, she still hearing. does. Okay. Yeah, she was born um, hearing uh, slightly, hard, hard of hearing. She was born hard of hearing. But her parents are both deaf completely, as is her sister and all her aunts and uncles. So she was born into a culturally deaf family where sign language was the primary language. And her hearing was not perfect ever. Uh, by the time she was a preteen, it was bad enough to where she went to deaf school, which is actually where she met my dad. Okay. Yeah, I was just a little confused about that. I, I was pretty sure that she was, yeah. but the, the hearing yeah, aids gave her a little, a little bit of what was going on. Yeah, and some uh, people also always assume that if somebody's deaf that they can't talk, and that's not always true. My mom talks very clearly. Some deaf people are raised in the oral method, 
uh, it, Alexander Graham Bell, that institution is actually an oral institution where they don't believe in sign language or using um, signs at all. Not not that they don't believe in it. That's just not their method. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's uh, it's something I actually have a, a little, perhaps a little more sympathy than, than someone else might. I actually had a about ten years ago some kind of a, a viral thing and cost me the hearing most most of the hearing on this side. Oh, wow! So there's a lot of adjustment that my family's made. So I, you know, yeah, I, I'm not. It's gone, gone, or will it come back? No, it's it's pretty much gone. It's been about ten oh. ten years. So yeah, my family's made a lot of adjustment. I've made a lot of adjustment. And when I coach, for example, when I when I coach, uh, I coach middle school girls soccer. When I do that, I tell the girls on the first day. Now, if you would like coach to know what you're saying, you stand on mm -hmm. this side. If, <laughs> if you if you, if it's not that important to you that I hear a word you're saying, you stand on this side. And it's really amazing. <laughs> or if you, they want to say stuff behind your back. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's really amazing. You don't think about how until you lose something like that. You don't think about how you really rely on hearing all around you. You would think, oh, well, you know, you've got one good ear. You can hear it. Well, no, actually. <laughs> yeah. There's so much going on. So anyway, uh, it was interesting to read um, in that regard. For me, it was interesting to read about, uh, you know, th this community of deafness and so, you know, how frustrating uh, for some. It yeah, can be. people don't uh, realize that it is an entire subculture that exists. And because you can't readily see that somebody is deaf the way you can a blind person because of their dog or their stick or a person in a wheelchair, it, it's quite possible there is a deaf person in the room with you and you have no idea. They're able to fully function uh, in ways that kind of mask. And that's why they. Um, don't really like to be called disabled or hearing impaired. They're deaf. They're not disabled. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and you and you make the distinction in the book uh, about using the lowercase d in situations and the the uh, the capitalized d to discuss the actual deaf community. Right. I thought that was an yeah. interesting distinction. Yeah. Yeah. Lowercase d is just the inability to hear, and a capital D deaf is culturally deaf. It's quite possible you would be a deaf person with the inability to hear but not raised culturally deaf and with this oral method it's quite possible you have no idea about deaf culture you've never attended a deaf school you don't participate in deaf theater or uh, other events like bowling tournaments and bass fishing tournaments and the things that my family participated in so yeah you can just have let and like you yourself let's say god forbid you lose hearing in your other ear you're not culturally deaf you're lowercase d deaf I'm pretty much lowercase whatever I do in life. I've noticed it just seems to be the way it goes. But uh -oh. now I, I should point out that we're, we're, we're not really here to uh, – you're, you're not here, I don't think, to be a representative of the deaf community so much as to talk about your particular story. So I want to ask you about that. Um, and I was sure – it's interesting. I was sure that your publicist uh, pitched this to me because she knew that I talked to Christian, and that was just an over-assumption on my part. But, and it was funny, as we started talking before we went, uh, we started recording, I assumed that you knew that I had spoken to your husband some time ago. And well, it, on it's just, Skype, it's just when you had, you had invited me on Skype and you said best to Christian, so I assumed you either knew him <laughs> or uh, in some form or fashion. You know, he's been in comedy for 15 years. He's been all over the country, all over the world. So, yeah, I just kind of assumed that you had some a connection with him, but I, no, I had no idea you actually interviewed him and that I had come up. Was, yeah, he always loves talking about uh, my family because it's more interesting than than other stuff. Well, it's definitely a conversation stopper. Yeah. I mean, you know. And, I, you know, so and as I kind of mentioned also in the introduction, I, I, I just tend, I tend away from stories, whether they're written, you know, in books or TV or you know Law and Order or movies where there's anything where children are in danger and that's something for me that changed when I became a parent. It just I just I was like horrified by mm -hmm. you know how we just casually throw these stories around. So I, I I wouldn't necessarily have come to your story and 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 want to talk about it because it's just these things make me uncomfortable, frankly. Yeah, but, it's very harrowing. <laughs> yeah, and then you know and then when you actually get into reading it, but I mean this is a page turner of a book. You you want to know. Uh, what's going on? I, I just can't imagine that there was anything or that there had to be, but there was nothing. I can't imagine there was anything fun in putting this story down on paper. 
You know, honestly, it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, of course, there are parts that are very difficult. Yeah. For instance, the, my father's attack on my mother. Or uh, the hardest scene for me to write was actually my vandalizing a uh, friend's home when I was about 14, 13, 14 years old. That was one of the worst things I've ever done in my life and something I never told anyone or talked about. Like once I got it behind me and we repaired the damage that we had done to this girl's home, I never talked about it again. It was the worst thing I've ever done. Writing that scene was actually one of the toughest. And then about my dog dying. Oh, my little Pammy. Oh. <laughs> I can't think. Of, you, you with children, uh, not being able to handle knowing children are suffering, I'm the same way with animals. Oh, yeah. I, I went down to New Orleans after Katrina because I could not watch, uh, sit back and watch on television the stuff that was happening. So I flew down to Katrina, New Orleans and stayed two weeks and rescued and uh, uh, brought all these animals back to this wow. farm. Yeah, yeah, it was a really amazing trip. But, um, but yeah, the I actually enjoyed recounting the childhood that we had in Montgomery because it was like, I talk about it in the book, I call it a Southern Fried Lord of the Flies. Right. It was insanely uh, wild and inv adventurous just playing football with colonies of bats that would come down and attack us and swimming in a creek with snakes and killing snakes and uh, uh, jumping off of a cliff with a vine like Tarzan it was just amazing yeah it's um I don't even know where to begin and I've you know, <laughs> I, I, and I've read through the book and I started but um you know, on, uh, over the years when I've uh, interviewed someone who came from poor beginnings, basically, uh, and, and <clears throat> I, you know, I hesitate to say not exactly from the Rockefellers on this side of the, of, of the, <laughs> of the conversation either, but, you know, people uh, tend to think of those were good times. That was all you knew. You, right. You, I mean, your parents were deaf. Um, you were poor. You know, you, you there was there was a series of evictions over the years, foreclosure, um, foreclosures. Yeah. You know, you you lost your uh, mobile home. I mean, but you still, you know, what's remarkable is you still look at that. There were a lot of good times in there. Absolutely, there's a lot of joy and laughter in our family, which is part of what was so devastating when my family fell apart and when my father finally just lost it and and attacked my mom is because. Although we were uh, struggling with money and everything, there was a lot of fun adventure in living in the woods. And Christian and I, uh, my husband and I, went to Peru for Christmas, this not this last year, the year before. And walking through uh, Cusco, I just kind of looked down an alley and I saw this little baby, barely a uh, year and a half maybe, able to sit up wearing a diaper, nothing else, covered in dirt, surrounded by dirt and chickens all over. He was playing with these dirty chickens. And I thought, oh, my God, that, that poor little baby. I would just want to walk, run down the alley, scoop him up and take him home and make his life better. And I thought, oh, no, no, no. The kid is happy sitting, playing in the dirt and probably thinking, I love my chickens. Yeah. I love chickens. When you're in it, you, are, you have no idea. It wasn't until I was a teenager and I started to see how the other half lived. And as a teenager, you know, you want to fit in. You want to have the clothes that have, all your peers are wearing. That's when it started to dawn on me and bother me that we didn't have certain things. And I, I'm, glad, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because it doesn't really I, – I didn't feel like it came across, I, I guess, that, that you felt um, bereft of things. I mean, you went out and worked. You, you got jobs. You – lied about your age to get jobs you started working very young you worked very hard um but i i never felt like um you you, you saw people with other things with things that you didn't have uh, but I, there was never the sense that i got reading the book at least that you were um terribly envious of them or that you wanted what they had you just you you you, you, you were recognizing a difference yeah, I think one of the uh, bonuses about being a child of deaf adults or CODA, C-O-D-A, I love that we can, I can show you these things. Um, being a CODA is you're put in, much like an immigrant family where English is a second language, you're put into a position of power and authority over adults. At a very young age, you're interpreting or managing certain things. I 
made airline reservations. I've been flying alone by myself since I was five years old, which is really kind of crazy. Um, but it, it empowered me and it made me realize, oh, life just isn't that complicated. If you want something, you go out and you work and you get it and you make it happen for yourself. So that was uh, one of the upsides of being a CODA is this independence and this knowing that I could do anything, really. It wasn't that hard. And so uh, it helped me establish very early on um, a good work ethic and a strong sense of self. But, yeah. But it's, it's interesting, Cambry, that um, you and your brother, your older brother, had completely different experience with this. Um, you know, he was the one who... Um, you know, he early on you thought of him as your protector, and and later again, but um, he he saw things that you didn't see, that you didn't know about until later. And I want I I want to be careful. I don't want to give away the end of the book because it's very dramatic, and we won't sell as many copies. You know, <laughs> um, uh, but but um, it's you came out of it. There were a lot of things that sort of adversity brought positive things in your life where you know you you didn't have you didn't have a strong role models for studying for example but you managed to see the importance of it and you got focused after a little distraction you got focused back on it your brother on the other hand you know i was con i was convinced that at, at several points in the story that your brother was going that was a ghost in the story and that he was going to be a casualty of the story yeah a lot of people actually said the same thing even though like people know that he does live my brother is alive and well and yeah. doing well thankfully um a lot of people were like oh, i thought for sure i was going to turn the page and find out he died that he'd o overdosed um i think there are two or maybe even three big differences and why I ended up going down the path that I did versus my brother. Uh, he's four years older than me, almost four years. And so a good chunk of his uh, childhood was not in the woods. It, he w didn't move to the woods until he was almost 12 years old. So he was living in a pretty bad part of Houston, mm -hmm. an urban uh, environment where he was associating with some older kids who smoked weed. I had heard, I don't remember if he told me, somebody told me that he had smoked weed at eight years old. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But he was smoking at a very young age, that I do know. And um, my parents were pretty open with their pot smoking. So there, uh, part of it was the 70s and they were bohemian. Um, and another part is just then when we moved into the woods that there was no uh, rule, there were no rules at all. Second, he's a boy, and I do think that parents, intentionally or not, treat girls differently. They're, they want to protect a girl in a way that they don't uh, with a boy. My brother was considered my dad's kind of wingman, and um, so I'm sure he was exposed to drinking and drugs in ways that I wasn't. And uh, I was kind of... My mother really handed down her love of reading to me, and she really kind of uh, focused that on me so much. And I do think that reading helps somebody focus on a life that's out there, a bigger place, and and helped me in school. That helped me in school for sure. But I do think that there are differences in the way parents treat their boys versus girls. I know you said you have kids. Do you have boys, girls, both? I have a teenage daughter. Just a one just, girl? Yeah, just a one. Yeah. And you probably... Uh, That's enough. A, oh, she's, she's a, teenage girl. Oh, oh my, my gosh. gosh. <laughs> Bless your heart. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. I would love to forget those age. Well, that and age. it's always interesting to read, you know, like to, to read in your book about your teenage years. Ooh. And, and <laughs> Sorry. I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking, wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm not stupid. I, I'm not ignorant about well, what's, what goes on. And she's a good kid. And, you know, I mean, I know, I know where... I think I know where you know issues lie and stuff. I'm not because there's only one. She gets a lot of yeah. attention. So, but but yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it was there were there were moments when I was reading about you know you working at the uh, Chuck E. Uh, Showbiz Pizza, Chuck E. Cheese, or Malibu Grand Prix, and you know and and, and the shopping and the, and you know like I said, I mean, not a Rockefeller here here either. And I think you know I I kind of connected to some of the things that maybe you were thinking, and I thought about things that you know maybe going through her head. So that was interesting to me. But I got to yeah. come back. I want to come back to your brother. Um, there were times in the book, uh, there was a particularly concentrated period 
where um, you don't know what's going on with your parents, but you know that your brother is scaring and beating the hell out of you. Mm -hmm. And no one seems to believe it. No one supports you. You have, you're living out in the woods. There's no one to turn to. You guys are on your own an awful lot, sometimes night after night. Mm -hmm. Um, That would terrify me. I mean, I, I just, I just can't imagine being you. You're obviously made of some very strong stuff to have gotten through a very, very dark period. Yeah. It, 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 it confused me for sure when my brother started turning on me because we had been close, very, very close, and we had a lot of friends in common. And just the sheer boredom of the woods and the lack of other children forced us to be uh, tight and playing football every day after school and things like that. But then he turned into a bully. And, you know, bullying is so prevalent in the press right now. Uh, and uh, as somebody who was bullied, and then also he kind of tricked me or uh, cajoled me into bullying a friend of mine. I, I, from that point of view, I always wonder, well, what's going on in the bully's life? I'd want to take that kid and really examine why is he acting or she acting out in the ways that they are because it, it comes from somewhere. And I didn't know it at the time, but my brother was witnessing uh, some behavior between my parents that I wasn't privy to. And he was like a one of those PSAs. I learned it by watching you, Dad. It was just like that. Yeah. And if if somebody had really uh, taken some time, if we had had resources out in the middle of the woods where my parents didn't have to work so hard and so long that they were there to supervise us better, it, I'm sure he wouldn't have acted out in the ways that he did. But, but he did. It, it's directly stemming from from what he was seeing in the, in the home. Well, that's it. I mean, and that's why, you know, I started talking talking about how you, you know, you love and appreciate what you know because it's all you know. Mm-hmm. And for him, that was just like, oh, is this the way I'm supposed to behave? Okay, then. That's what I'll I'm do. I'm sure he's frustrated and bored. And, you know, you're talking about the different paths that we took. I was very active in sports, and I loved theater. And those, I think, being active in, in performing arts in the theater program saved me from going down the same path because I was was down. I was going down that path. I was smoking pot and drinking and acting out. And I vandalized my, my girlfriend's house and did really rotten things. And then once we moved out of the woods and up to Dallas-Fort Worth area, North Richland Hills, I got involved in the one-act play competition in the theater program. And uh, it, it changed it changed my life. And I think those programs, especially for girls, athletics and, and theater arts and stuff, it's really important to be involved in those. I agree. Find something that you love and do it. Now, there is I, there was one part of the book that made me actually laugh out loud. and so I want to <laughs> Only share, one? Well, this, this made me laugh out loud. I mean, it was kind of like, you know, I just started laughing. And it was... Uh, uh, I, I guess it's okay to share this. It, it, there was a part where a point where your mother takes you to audition, uh. right? The first, <laughs> yeah. But you don't. Do you really not know what the play you're auditioning? Oh, for? I had no clue. No, I had no clue. Can you? Yeah, I was maybe, like eight, maybe. Can, maybe you can tell uh, what happens here because you'll tell it better than I will. Yeah. So essentially, my mother. Uh, I I think that she. Uh, she wanted to encourage my love of theater arts, and, and we were so isolated in the woods. I don't know how she found out about an audition, but uh, Montgomery was about a 40-minute drive from Conroe. Conroe was the largest town north of Houston, and I'm sure you've never heard of Conroe, so it's like, that's the big town. Yeah. So I don't even know if I had gotten this part, how we would have managed to go to all the rehearsals and everything. But she just tells me we're going to an audition. And I had been the lead in a school play back in Houston. I had been the lead in the second grade school pageant. Uh, I played mother. You're looking at mom. Hmm. And I was awesome. And I think I got that only because I could project really well. And a child of deaf adults, um, I, as a child in a deaf family, I, I adopted all the communication traits that a deaf family has. And so for sign language to convey emotion, you know, it's all in your face. And I'm, I'm using my hands right now, even though I'm not saying anything in sign language. I just, I, I fully engage. And I was also very loud because my mother was deaf, <laughs> even with her hearing aids. 
And a deaf household is not quiet. Everything's really, really loud. They don't know how loud they are, slamming cupboards and doors and pots and pans and stuff. So my mom tells me, we're going to this audition. And she's like, okay, Camry, make sure you project. And I'm like, oh, I can do that. I got that down, Pat. <laughs> so I get to this theater, and it's a community theater, and there's a, a ring of actors and the director. They're all in a big circle. And when it's your turn, you would go into the center, and you'd read your part. So I get up there, and I just start shouting the lines, but also using my exaggerated facial expressions and stuff. So I'm like, ah! And determined not to be like other girls, you know, just Texas twang, and just ridiculous. And the director's like, oh, oh, stop, stop, no, no, no. <laughs> and she, you can tell she's dying. She is dying about to laugh. And the other people in the circle, they're all like, oh, what's going on? Who is this kid? And I had sheet white hair, like a white toe head kid. And uh, she's like, no, 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 oh, that's good. Well, Cambry, you know. You certainly can't project. <laughs> and you enunciate very well. I was like, all right, I nailed it. I nailed it. That's what my mother told me to project, and I did. And the director, she agreed. But everybody clearly was just mortified. <laughs> and it turned out that, uh, you know, I was auditioning for the role of Anne Frank. <laughs> it still but, makes me laugh. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, when I think back to that, I'm just, I get mortified for just the ignorance uh, uh, in my just naivete. I had no idea. And I don't know if my mom even knew what the play was or who Anne Frank was. Surely she, I don't know what she was thinking. <laughs> so all Anne Frank was trying to be quiet. So I shouldn't be shouting. And also white hair, Texas twang, not a Jewish girl. No, no. I'm German. I'm <laughs> almost 100% German. Yeah. <laughs> well, I actually thought with all the, uh, the hand, the hand motion, maybe Texas Italian or something, but okay. Yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I, I, that story just, it just cracked me up. I just, uh, and it just mortified me to the point where, because I knew, I knew that I had embarrassed myself and I didn't quite know why at the time, but uh, it scared me away from auditions for years. And it wasn't until I moved up to Fort Worth and I even skipped a few auditions because I was just terrified. And then finally go, got over the fear and auditioned for something and I landed the part. <laughs> Well, I wanted, yeah, that's, I wanted to use that story in this kind of the same way that you did in the book, in that it's almost like a little bit of a bridge because then things start to take a turn. Yeah. And so I, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, life changed when you left uh, uh, Boar's Head and mm -hmm. you left uh, kind of the, the rural thing. Um, what I what I wanted to get a sense of from you though was, did life take this kind of turn for the worse? Was it a, as you look back? Was it immediate or was it gradual? I mean, at the it time, I bet been, it felt gradual. Well, it had been gradual. It, it, what the difference was is that I wasn't really seeing it. Being so isolated in the woods, um, my father he was missing work, and uh, he was not coming home for a weekend. But we were so isolated, it kind of made sense. Well, he went out with friends on a Friday night, and he was. And maybe had too much to drink, so he just decided to stay with friends or, or whatever. And it didn't seem out of the ordinary or out of the question mm -hmm. that he would do something like that. It worried me because my mom wouldn't tell me where he was or what was going on. But when we moved to the city, we're now in a two-bedroom home. I think, or maybe it was it was a three-bedroom. Sorry, three-bedroom home in the suburbs, and the bars are now right across the street, and they're not a forty-five minute drive one way. So my dad was coming home hammered and sitting on the couch, passed out. And I was seeing this now firsthand, really, how much he was drinking. And he couldn't seem to hold down a job, partly because of the drinking, but also because the IRS was now on our tail. And if he got a job, they'd immediately start garnishing his wages. So, uh, so he's not working. He's drinking too much. And I am more responsible than him, it looks like. And it starts to bother me. You know, here I am working hard for my money and for my clothes. And I was supporting myself. I was loaning him lunch money and cigarettes. And um, so I'm now really seeing for the first time just how 
troubled my dad is. And going back to, you know, you had said that you had laughed about that story about the Anne Frank, and it was an, it's a nice moment of levity. You know, developing this memoir, I told a lot of stories on stage in storytelling shows and comedy clubs here in New York. And uh, it helped me really find where the funny parts are because I did not, I'm not a, I'm not a sad person. I've forgiven my parents, my my father, of really horrendous crimes, yeah. and, and I'm I'm okay. I'm happy, and I'm you know I'm doing well. And uh, I didn't want to have people read this book and just be sobbing because it is a sad story, yeah. but it doesn't. It's not full of sadness. It's full of hope. I think. Mm -hmm. So uh, just I wanted to clarify that. Yeah, it's not a maudlin tale by any stretch. No, no. But, I, yeah. I mean, frankly, I, you know, there were parts of the book where I felt threatened by your dad's behavior, and I was astonished that you didn't at those times in, in recounting the story. Uh, it was just that's what you were accustomed to, right? That's yeah. Yeah. Whenever he started uh, uh, turning on my boyfriends, when I started dating, and he started getting uh, really uh, overprotective <laughs> is a kind word, uh, he was... Uh, saying the n-word and um, just stalking me mm. that was frightening that's when it got where i drew the line i was like all right he's not contributing to the household income he's drinking too much and now he's stalking me no 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 we're not having this and i basically put my foot down and told my mom she needed to get a divorce and that's where it was like i i can't imagine a teenage kid saying that to their parents so bluntly but that's the relationship we had because I'd been in this authoritative position as an interpreter and a coda I, I and my mom and I were close that I felt like I had the right to demand that she get a divorce and then finally she did yeah. or she did ask for one and one of the big turning points for you I think was was as you started dating and you 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 saw that well your brother was your brother was out of the picture at this time your, yeah, now he's your one time protector. Drug addict. Yep, yeah. he's, he's he's gone. But you 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 seem savvy enough to recognize that another man in your life, someone who put you first, could protect you and ultimately get you out of this situation that you otherwise had no control over. I, I was very impressed that you you were smart enough to, to see things that way. Well, and I picked a good man too. Uh, he was a, a sailor in the Navy. He he was a mechanic. He worked on F-14 Tomcats, which was pretty awesome at the time because Tom Cruise and uh, uh, what was that name? Top Gun. Top Gun. He, that had just come out, so it was just like ah, uh, he's wearing uh, uh, dungarees and he's on an F-14. My like uh, yeah, my uterus was just like yeah, me, <laughs> give me, give me, must have now. Um, but uh, it, the thing is, is that. I, I didn't believe in uh, Cinderella tales. I, I really hated the movie Pretty Woman. I, I found her just, it, just the whole scenario disgusting that a woman couldn't do this on her own and she had to wait for a knight in shining armor. But at the same time, I really needed a knight in shining armor because clearly my parents weren't in a position to help me and I wasn't able to help myself. I, I didn't, I, I needed help. And we should clarify, because I'm assuming most people who watch this have not read the book yet, that uh, the sailor, his name was Rob. This was not Christian. Oh. This is your first husband. Yeah. And and you, I think I can give away at the end of the book, because you do mention that you've stayed in contact and you've had an enduring relationship with him and his family. Did he under, fully understand that this was not entirely about love for you, that this was, you needed you needed saving at that point? Yeah, and I think it was probably intoxicating for him to save a girl and uh, to be the knight. And um, you know, and and we did love each other. And we we if we didn't, we wouldn't still be friends now. Uh, we were good, very good friends. And um, but I he's very very far away from his home, and he's lonely. You know, he's from Akron, Ohio, which actually I'm going there next week, and I'm seeing all his family. When they're all gonna come out to see us. Um, so you know, he's alone and lonely and needs a family and my mom was such a great mother-in-law to him and it gave him a place to belong so it's a mutual thing for sure yeah um has he has he read the book 
I think so, yeah. If he hasn't, uh, I know he was sick for a while. A couple of weeks ago we were texting about it, but um, I, I would imagine by now he's read it. And if he hasn't, I'm going to break his neck. So. <laughs> great. More violence in the, in the Cruz <laughs> oh, <yeah>. family. <laughs> great, 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 great. Um, uh, but I, do you, will he find, if he hasn't already read it, or when he read it, will he have found things in there that, that he did not know to this point about what was going on? No, he knew. He knew. knew. And he reminded me of things that I'd forgotten about, like having to pick my mom up from work because my dad was stalking her there. Some events that I have zero recollection of, which it's so funny to to know that I have a very clear picture uh, and uh, memories of certain events. And then just others, they're just gone. I have have no memory of. Yeah, and he and I have talked about memories that aren't in the book, like um, uh, picking my brother up from a bus station and he was just uh, either, he was just out of his mind and uh, either on drugs, he's had to have been, I think, or just so dazed and hungry and homeless uh, and we'd pick him up from a Greyhound station and just drop him off somewhere else. Yeah, just troubled. These are the things that they don't tell you when people are excited about you getting married. They don't tell you that you're not just marrying this person. Mm-hmm. Like Rob was not marrying Cambry alone. Rob was marrying all of the Cruz family. And, mm-hmm. and so, and you married, we don't need to get into it, but you married extremely young to the point where your mother had to be there uh, to 17. give permission. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, they don't tell a 17 year old, hey, because if, if the shoe was on the other foot and it was Rob's family that had, and who knows? I don't know anything about Robert and his family. But if it was his family that had this type of issues, no one's going to tell a 17-year-old teenager girl who's marrying into this family what it's really going to be about, what's ahead of you. Uh, mm-hmm. I give him a lot of credit. You know, I, I, that he, uh, he obviously loved you. you. You were married, I think, six years. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he, was, he was the right guy in the right time and the right place for you. And you've got to give a guy like that a lot of credit, just as I give you yeah. credit for recognizing what you needed because you know there were there were a lot of coping skills that were not handed to you. Yeah, and we we laugh about it now. Like, what on earth were we thinking? Getting married? Um, like he was he was older. He was almost twenty three. He turned twenty three like two weeks after we got married. But still, that's still young. It's like, what were we thinking? I don't know. But luckily, we all came out of it alive and <laughs> better for it. I think that's a good thing. Um, and speaking of coming out of it better, I mentioned. Um, your brother, and, and we talked a little about your brother, uh, David, having had this incredibly frightening uh, period of his life. Um, I don't, I don't want to give away too much, but he did come out on the other end. I was astonished. I'll just say this. I was astonished to read th- at one point in the story that he's studying for his his, uh, his master's. And Which he's got. Yeah, he's got it already. Uh, yeah. uh, you know. Um, you Took know. him a long time, but yeah. He uh, set himself back uh, with the drug addiction, of course, but luckily he was able to get clean um, through Teen Challenge, which is kind of like a Jesus Detox camp. I, I'm not a big fan of, of the hyper-religious stuff, but it saved him, so I'm thankful for it. And he, a lot of addicts end up becoming addicted to Jesus Christ. And he went through a, a real hardcore phase of that, but he has since, you know, toned it down, and, you know, he's found a balance between, between it, but great um yeah and and one of the things i want to point out to folks who are who are hearing us talk about this and uh the story is is told in kind of a parallel way um the first thing we we, we're introduced to in the book at the beginning is you're coming Mm -hmm. really i think for the first time to visit your dad in prison Mm -hmm. and so and then we go kind of backwards and you tell the story chronologically uh, about what happened in your life and then we kind of periodically keep coming back to this visit in prison. Um, I guess we need to explain a little bit without giving too much away. What happened with your dad that he wound up in prison? I mean, uh, well, uh, you know, it's, it's no secret. It's pretty much out there. He's in for attempted murder for 20 years. Uh, he a- attacked his girlfriend uh, at the time they'd been dating about a year, or almost two years. And, uh, he viciously attacked her, and they, he, there's no question that he's guilty, although that he will tell you yeah. otherwise. Of course. Nobody in jail is guilty. I just find, I think people would be more apt to help prisoners in prison reform if everyone accepted guilt. It's kind of like with, yeah, uh, 
Hugh Grant is the only um, example that I can ever come up with. But he's, uh, <laughs> when he was caught with the prostitute, he immediately said, yeah, I did it. Yeah, sorry. And then you move on. The sooner you say, yes, I did it and I'm culpable, I'm responsible, the sooner everybody heals and moves on from it. Uh, I don't know if I'd make, I don't know if that would be the, I don't know if that'd be the example I would use because. Uh, it's not the was, best example. He was, but well, I mean, here's a man who was with a prostitute getting what he was paying for, <laughs> enjoying himself. He gets caught and he's like, you know, he's like, you know, yeah. well, okay, yeah, I, I, th- that I'll admit I was, you know, <laughs> I did that, and, you know, I'm a bad boy and, you know, and then he starts getting million dollar movie contracts. So, you know, mm-hmm. but yeah, I, I know what you're saying. It, 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 acknowledgement. Um, it was interesting to me, though, and correct me if I got this wrong. You uh, you did forgive your dad in a lot of ways, and you 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 wrote to your dad in prison, but you only, as of the, the writing of the book, vis- had visited him that one time. Mm-hmm. Um, is it is it that it's easier for you to keep the good in your memory of what your life was like with your dad by st- by keeping your distance? Is that what yeah. that's about? I, I have gone to visit him uh, more often, and I do write him pretty regularly, and as he and he writes me as well. Um, I, the prison is the main reason why we're able to have this relationship. If you were out, I'm not sure how much I would trust him, or how much of uh, I would want him in my life, how much interaction I would want with him. Um, I know where he is. He's clean and sober. Not technically sober but sober by circumstance right. uh, so he's and he's not hurting anyone in there so I'm able to communicate with him that way and there are a couple of uh, things about it it's like I I didn't commit a crime so I why do I get robbed of my father because he committed a sin and a, a one in four black children has a parent in prison by the time they're 14 years old that's astounding and when a parent goes to prison, the, the child is also sentenced to time without guidance and a, a role model, be it a bad role model or not, uh, having a parent in your life does make a difference. And uh, so it's like, I, I haven't done anything wrong, so I do deserve to have some communication and some father figure. And then there is a study that says the recidivism rate for prisoners is dramatically decreased when they have regular communication with a family member on the outside. It's a tremendous in, uh, uh, percentage that it, even with just one visit, it drops 20%. One visit. Hmm. And so I thought, well, maybe this is an opportunity to try to help him become a better man. I don't know how fixable he is. He might be irreparably broken, and I think that's probably the case. But at least it's worth maybe trying because the state of Texas has decided he only got 20 years, and that means he'll be our problem again soon. Whenever people talk about, oh, prisoners, they, you, we spend more on them. with the, they, they get free college and free television and all that. It's like we're doing, not doing it for them. We're doing it for us right. because when they get out, <laughs> they're our problem again. And let's try to fix them while they're in there so that it's less of an issue when they get out. Um, for, for my dad, I'm not sure if he's fixable. But if, they, if he serves his full term, he'll be 75 when he gets out. And my hope is, is that I'll be able to take him. In a fight, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, yeah, you're in a, yeah. I don't knock him in his knees. I don't know. I'll tell you what. My dad, as he got older, had this like superhuman grip. He he was <sighs> a skinny little guy. You know, built similarly. But the grip. If he if he shook your hand, I swear. I some I was just like I would just pass. Yeah. Just, so the last time Christian saw my dad in in prison, he gave him a hug. My dad gave Christian a hug, and while he's getting hugged, Christian says to me, "Because my dad's deaf, he can't hear what Christian's saying." He's like, "Oh my God, Camber, he's so strong!" And I'm like, yeah. "I know. That's why he's going to stay in for a while until he gets weaker with age." But I don't know. I don't see it happening. He's 65 now. Will you send him, or have you sent him the book? Um, the prison has to read it first. What happens is. Um, it, the you send a book and it has to come directly from like Amazon or Barnes and Noble or the publisher. It can't come from me. Okay. I can't mail it to them. Um, and so now that the book is out, I've sent it via Amazon. 
the prison, they receive it, they check the title against the list of approved titles. They'll see, oh, this isn't on there. So then they set it aside for review, and somebody actually has to read it and approve it. From what I understand, they actually don't read word for word. They just kind of skim, skim it. And my fear is that because the very first pages are about me smuggling gum into a prison, and not just any prison, yeah. their actual prison. Right, right. They might take issue with it, um, but we'll see. I, I haven't heard back yet. But the gum got caught. Oops. The gum got caught by the uh, in my dad's mouth. Right. But my dad actually ended up getting all the smuggled in gum into. Oh, this, he did. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. All right. I don't. I, I don't say that part in the book. So you haven't at the at this point that we're we're talking about this, uh, March uh, 22nd, 2012, uh, your relationship with your dad has not yet been affected by the book because clearly he hasn't gotten it yet. Yeah. Do you have any My, concern about that? No. Um, I, I feel like, okay, there are a couple of scenarios that, should, that could play out. He'll read it, he'll hate me forever and disown me for the rest of his life. Well, uh, I don't think that would happen... Because uh, for other reasons I'll get to, but if that happens, I'll be sad. I'll be disappointed because I think that this is a real opportunity for us to uh, make him better and grow and, and learn and heal. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I am pretty happy with the last ten years that he's been in jail. I'm I'm I feel like I've gotten a tremendous amount out of his. Uh, letters, and I've learned more about him than I've ever, uh, than most daughters ever know about their fathers. Um, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm thankful for the relationship that we've had over the last 10 years. And if this is the end of it, uh, it'll be sad and disappointing, but so be it. It's his choice. My guess is, is that he will read it, and he'll initially be angry or upset, but then he'll be so um, enamored of being the center of a book. <laughs> that's that's a bit. Yeah, you're a, he, see, you yeah. are a savvy woman. You you do see <laughs> things. Yeah. Well, he loves reading books about death serial killers. There was a death <laughs> serial killer. Yeah, he reads all the books about Aileen Warnos and all. He loves reading these true crime books. Oh, so the fact that he'll be the subject of one is probably going to be very intoxicating to him. But also, I've told him, listen, I told this book. From my point of view, and my mom helped, and it's only fair that if you want to tell your side of the story that we do that, and we can work on that together, but with him being in jail, it's just too complicated, the letter writing, it's just too yeah. long, like, if I could Skype with him like we are now, mm -hmm. I could write this for him in an instant, it's not going to happen. And also, it would have to be a, a book based on true events, because my father is like the National Enquirer. It's like, there's a shred of truth in all his stories, right. but there's also a lot of BS. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like his Elvis imitation. He, uh, In his <laughs> mind, he's doing Elvis perfectly, but for everyone else, okay, there's something there that reminds me of somebody, but I can't quite place it. Yeah. 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 Well, all right, so before we wrap up, and, and you've been very gracious with your time, and, and I have to admit I was far more interested in this than, than I ever expected I would be oh, because good. it's not, you know. But so the reason you're here, again, is because I had this conversation with your husband Christian several years ago, and it, it really, you know, it stayed with me all this time. So i got to ask you, when you met him, Christian, when you met Christian, um, you know, how long do you do, do you know each other? How long do you date before this comes out? Before you yeah. start saying, let me tell you, before we get any more involved here, let me tell you something about my family. It actually came up on our first date, <laughs> which right. is totally not the way it should happen. <laughs> well, and t we had actually known each other for a few weeks prior to our first real date, so it wasn't like a, a total stranger, like where this is it. They're like, hi, I'm Camry. Nice to meet you. Let's right. sit down and have a date. It, so uh, we had known each other. We ran in the same circles. I was involved in more theater versus comedy at the time, but there is always some overlap with comedians and actors and stuff. Um, so we have mutual friends. And sitting down, I had asked him uh, to tell me about his family, his mom. And it, I, his face just kind of was like, oh, it just changed. He did not want to talk about this. And I was like, oh, no, 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 I totally get it. I get it. And he's like, yeah, because there is this stigma uh, 
stereotype maybe is the right word about how uh, when you're dating somebody um, a man is going to treat you the same way he treats his mother or a woman if she's got daddy issues mm -hmm. she's gonna, you know there's these stereotypes and so it's a delicate conversation in dating somebody and getting to know someone but whenever he had that reaction I was like dude I get it and, and for whatever reason it just all came out both sides of our families we just laid it all out and it was kind of a bonding thing honestly wow. because a lot of people don't understand how complicated and difficult it is when you have a sociopathic jail death dad yeah and it's not your everyday thing. Well, and was that was something that, that made an immediate positive impression on you, that he, the way he handled it? Oh, yeah, and I think he was impressed uh, that I was able to talk about it and not be a crying sack, because we had met uh, just a few months after my dad had been imprisoned. It, it was very, very fresh. And honestly, when he, we think back to it, he can't believe that it was that fresh. He doesn't recall that being so new for me because I talked about it just as we're talking now. It wasn't this uh, just gaping wound and just weeping and sorrow and all that. I guess I'm more pragmatic. I, just, that's the way it is. I, you know, pragma pragmatic, pragmatism, I think that fits you very well from what, I, you know, from what I've read and, and having the experience of talking with you today. Um, so what what's next? What will there be? Will you will you go and do another book? Right? <coughs> You're very involved in uh, comedy uh, as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, I booked the ninety two Y Tribeca. Uh, I used to run a space called Ochi's Lounge, which is in the basement of Comics, which was a big comedy club here in New York, mm -hmm. and I was their PR marketing director. Uh, they since closed, so I'm in the midst of trying to find a new space because Ochi's Lounge was something I was really proud of and it was doing really well. And if comics hadn't closed, then Ochi's wouldn't have had to. Um, I found a, a place with Carol Hartzell called Luca Lounge and where we raised money to fix the roof and, and stuff. So hopefully that will be the space. Uh, it's in the Lower East Side, East Village area. And so I'm working on that. And then also I want to adapt the book into a solo show because I'd mentioned earlier how I do storytelling shows. Mm -hmm. Um, but also why it's important to me is because sign language is not a written language. It's meant to be seen. And deaf culture is a very much a storytelling community. So I think it kind of begs to be put on stage so that the deaf can enjoy it, but also so that he, the hearing community can see what it's like, what deaf culture really is like. There's not a lot of uh, entertainment out there that shows it. Now there's this TV show, Switched at Birth, and that, that's nice, but I do think that uh, somebody in the deaf community had emailed me and said, it's nice to see a book that doesn't just say the goody two-shoes side. Um, usually when there's a book about deaf culture or deaf, uh, being a coda or whatever, it almost glamorizes deafness without being really practical or truthful about some of the downsides of it. Mm -hmm. My mom's a really great shining example of somebody excelling in the deaf community, and my father's the polar opposite. And I think it's important to see what those dangers are. How did my dad become that way? So that if you're a hearing parent and you have a deaf child, you can avoid the pitfalls that send somebody down this path. Because there is a lot of anger and frustration at any kind of disability. Mm. Wow. Uh, I tell you, folks, uh, you could, you may think that you, you've you've heard everything about this book while we've been talking. We we haven't even touched it. We haven't scratched the surface here. You, surface. It's right. quite yeah. I mean, it, there's a lot there. Uh, and you can find uh, "Burn Down the Ground" by Cambry Cruz in great bookstores everywhere, or you can order it right now at a great price at MrMedia.com via Amazon.com. So go to MrMedia.com. Maybe you're on the page right now watching us. You, there's a button there. You can order the book right now. Uh, you have a website, I think? I do. It's cambrycruise.com. That's K-A-M-B-R-I-C-R-E-W-S. Nobody ever gets it right. Uh, well, it's good to spell. <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you do Twitter, Facebook, any of that stuff as well? I am uh, Twitter at Cambry, K-A-M-B-R-I. That's the nice thing about having an unusual name. It's just Cambry, that's that, it. That makes it easy. All right. <laughs> well, uh, Cambry, uh, delightful to talk to you. Fascinating story. Uh, Me too. And, and give our best to your husband. And thank you so much I'm for joining us. Sleeping in the other room. Oh. oh. <laughs> hey, Christian. <laughs> thank you. All right.
Thanks for being with us. For more original interviews, surf over to our main website, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. If you've enjoyed today's show, subscribe for free to Mr. Media via email, RSS, or iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Another good idea? Download our new free Mr. Media mobile app in the Android market. And you can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many parts of the Internet. Show your support of Mr. Media by supporting our sponsors, including Audible. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash radio. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash radio for your free audiobook. We're also supported by the thepartyauthority.us. Call DJ Ira for all your party entertainment needs nationwide at 1-800-DIAL-DJs or visit their website, thepartyauthority.us. If you've got an idea for a guest, a comment on today's show, or would like to advertise on Mr. Media Radio, email me directly at bob at mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. You can also call our 24-hour listener line at 1-727-498-4711. Some messages may be used in an upcoming show. And unless you live next door to Mr. Media, there may be a toll charge. You can also follow Mr. Media on Facebook, Twitter, or our new YouTube and Vimeo video channels. Thanks so much for joining us today. I always appreciate you sharing a piece of your day with Mr. Media. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Hey everybody, this is Bob Andelman from Mr. Media. First of all, I want to thank you for years of support uh, listening to the show. We're starting our sixth year, it's hard to believe, our sixth year uh, as 2012 starts and heading towards our 1,000th online podcast, uh, audio and video. It's uh, pretty amazing, <laughs> frankly. Uh, I remember starting it several years ago thinking, this will never last. And podcasts, that's as stupid a word as blogging. But here we are, <laughs> starting our sixth year and heading up to a thousand interviews. And I want to thank everybody for uh, listening and supporting the show. I also want to tell you that, uh, you know, one of the things that's been very helpful for this show is Stitcher Radio. Yes, this is sort of a commercial. Now, there are millions of smartphone apps in the world, but I only use one several times a day, Stitcher Radio. I build my own radio station to listen to broadcast and online shows when I want and in the order I want. CNN News Update, Onion Radio News, WTF with Mark Marin, MSNBC's Morning Joe, Studio 60, the TechCrunch headlines, and of course, Mr. Media. It's free. It works on iPhone, Android, BlackBerry, Palm Pre, and much more. And you can get it for free for yourself. Try it out. I guarantee you're going to love it. Stitcher.com slash MR Media. That's Stitcher.com slash Mr. Media. You're going to love it. And thanks again for supporting the show. <laughs>